So I love that you brought that up. Explain that to me about potentially waiting until you, let's say, congregate with people that you knew from the past. And let's say you have advisors, mentors that are connected to you through local communities or someone highly reputable that's done something public facing, right? So maybe taking the time does make sense versus rushing into private equity, like venture capital funding. Like this purpose, the, the purpose part of it. Yeah. I have a friend that have a beautiful idea. I make this nice portal, and at the end of round one, two, three, four, he end up owning zero point five percent of his company. And where is the motivation for somebody to go ahead with the business that he started from zero if he doesn't own it? It doesn't make sense, right? So we see need to learn not to be so greedy to want too much, because those that want too much end up with nothing, you know. And on the other side, don't give away so much. You know, be happy with less and do little steps and grow together. Choose people that bring you money, but bring also knowledge, bring also connections, bring also market opportunity, because those are more valuable than the money. Money at the end of the day, yes, are important, but, uh, you know, uh, they're, they're one small part of, uh, of the things that are required to make a successful business, uh, mostly in technology, where with just a small computer and a little bit of electricity you can do everything you know oh yeah. yeah 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 money is just time and so if you're willing to put in time uh, and you have the skill yeah. obviously if you have the skill the capability then because most most sorry sorry i didn't mention that but okay. most of the vc they look at the opportunity to invest early and get out with an exit at the second round with the revenue and at a certain point they don't really love what you're doing they use yeah. you in a certain way as a vehicle mm. to uh, you know multiply their money faster so sometimes they even give suggestions because i heard there are bad ones they give suggestions that are not really healthy <laughs> for few, the few, yeah. uh, sure. but, but they're just convenient for them you know so uh, and vice versa i i saw startup convincing people to put their money and they had nothing to offer in reality because they were very good to pretend so that's why i put myself in the middle many times just to as a consultant just to assure both sides of uh, yes. the the correct yes. aspect of the deal to make sure the deal is successful yeah tell, so talk to me about that so uh, so you're brokering in effect or you're the intermediary you have allegiance to one side or the other side whoever you know, uh, uh, brought you on but you're essentially connecting Right, so the developers who may not be business savvy or understand the process or the motivations, intent of the VCs, and the VCs who are, I mean, you know, they're not you know all predators at all. I mean, it's just these guys looking to invest, and they have their stored industriousness in the form of capital, and they want to deploy it hopefully into someone or a group, a team, with the use case and the competency to develop it. Right, uh, and they want to back that horse, if you will. They want to make that investment. That would be a good match. How would you go about that matching process? Everybody, welcome to another episode of Warrior Cast. We have with us Roberto Capticci. I said that wrong, didn't I? All right, well, it doesn't matter. It's okay. it was close. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for having me here. It's a pleasure to be here, though. Yeah, no, the pleasure is all ours. So, uh, Roberto, I gave a brief intro prior to this uh, discussion, so people sort of know already who you are, where you've come from. But I'd like to give you the chance, just from your own mouth, to tell everybody. Uh, who you are and, and what you do and did you explore? Sure, then. my name is Roberto Capodici. I'm Italian. I live in Asia since 18 years ago. Um, I love IT, computer, technology, and uh, I am into decentralization even before blockchain was a thing because I was trying to hack the BitTorrent protocol to make a decentralized uh, hard drive. <laughs> and uh, anyway, I was there at the right time, at the right moment with blockchain, and so here I am now. Okay, so you're, you're, you're a very humble guy, um, so uh, w tell me a little bit, uh, so okay, I've heard that uh, you're one of the good guys, you're the OG 
one of the OGs in, uh, in blockchain and uh, DeFi and uh, specifically blockchain. Uh, so tell me a little bit about growing up. Let's let's get to pre-professional uh, Roberto over here. How how was life? What what influences in your life brought you over into being driven towards wanting to see a decentralized uh, system, world of decentralized systems? Yeah, I, I had this thing about my computer since I was a little kid, uh, very much supported by my parents. Uh, my father was uh, an incredible mathematician and uh, really drove me into coding computer when I was five, six years old. Uh, I already started making some uh, applications. So it was it was interesting. As soon as I had uh, a modem, I set up uh, like a bulletin board system uh, so people can dial in uh, and uh, there were sort of network of uh, this bulletin board system. There was a lot of communication and I liked that uh, I can interact with people at distance. Uh, so that, that always uh, remaining to me. I, I had a CB, the citizen band, uh, you know, radio. So all these sort of things brought me into doing uh, uh, exploration into the uh, information technology communications. Uh, uh, I did my dose when I was a little kid. There was no illegal uh, phone hacking. Uh, I knew how to make free phone calls anywhere in the world. Sometimes we were calling random number in Japan just because the idea that from Italy in I could move a person in Japan, uh, you know, it's getting incredible. them up of their chair was extremely exciting uh, you know there were now all the technology that we have today to talk <laughs> like we're doing now from different parts of the world in real time so that's what drove me into uh, communication telecommunication you know computer even more and then eventually the centralization because this is the king of uh, a system to communicate uh, in a network so peer-to-peer -peer network are an exciting technology and we're going to explore why, but so someone who's looking at really, so this is disruptive or emergent tech, the idea of decentralization, and um, it has a lot of promises to it. Before we dive too deep, I still want to get a better understanding of you. So tell me a little bit about your educational experience prior to your professional experience, please. Sure, I, I try to follow the normal path to the regular school, but I've been kicked out from two uh, schools oh, because patterns. I was too distracted learning to code computer than following the lessons. So I end up to take a, a piece of paper diploma just uh, studying IBM mainframes and how to do system administration for uh, uh, IBM AS400, AS38, uh, 36 uh, that there were at the time, and how to code application into those mainframes, which has been a very interesting uh, experience uh, that came back uh, useful in life uh, ahead. But uh, that has been mostly a compromise between me and my parents uh, to just to be able to <laughs> go to school. And, also... and you're all right. We're, we're cool. We'll keep you around, but you got to go to school. So you're cool. <laughs> <laughs> something like that so you know okay. uh, everybody happy <laughs> okay exactly exactly right okay so so you got by cool to parents that's great you've done so much since then um, what I'm really interested in is sort of well we're gonna get into what you're doing now which is fascinating I want to just speak to our younger audience right now so our younger audience right now is like a group of three to four devs who are super smart and I mean, so a lot of them are in the States, a lot of them are in Canada, and, and they're kind of close to these VC hubs. But a lot of them are also in like the global south, right? And so they're just not connected to any capital pools or resources uh, as, as readily as, 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 uh, as us Northern Americans have that, that privilege to be. So um, can you give them some suggestions, right? Because this is what you used to do. Uh, what should they do? You know, how could... How, should they seek VC funding? How should they go about it? What are the benefits? What are the red flags? What's the what? What should they look for? Just have at. I think um, getting VC funding is a good shortcut. Uh, Some time is necessary, but uh, the biggest satisfaction is to self finance. To so start uh, with a small uh, result that can be sold, generate revenue, and then grow from there. This has two positive effects. One, that you don't have a financial uh, you know, situation with other party, uh, you keep owning 100% of your business. And second, that uh, you grow a little bit slower, which allow you to do things better. You need yes. to do step by step to reach long distances, okay? Now, that said, uh, if somebody wants to go to an investor, uh, he has to remember that uh, people get excited about their product. Investors look at the people that they're investing on. They invest in the product as a second stage, but uh, they need to 
trust uh, and uh, feel confident with the people they have on. A beautiful story behind what is happening and why people do this project is a very important thing. A very uh, strong team, uh, people that know each other since they were kids, uh, you know, and uh, they have to do this application because that is big problem in life and this was solving it uh, are the best ingredients. Uh, to bring in uh, some uh, fundings. Obviously, don't lie, be sincere. So I'm not suggesting to come up with a fantasy story because no, lie no. have a short break, so as we say, they come out very fast. But uh, if there is a good reason, that's why I do believe if somebody has a mission in life to do this kind of application, to do this kind of service, uh, is going to be perseverant in this and working on it. And sooner or later, is going to succeed uh, with the support of their party or by themselves. So uh, so you're brokering, in effect, or you're the intermediary. You have allegiance to one side or the other side, whoever you know, uh, uh, brought you on. But you're essentially connecting, right? So the developers who may not be business savvy or understand the process or the motivations and intent of the VCs and the VCs who are, I mean, you know, they're not, you know, all predators at all. I mean, it's just these guys looking to invest and they have their stored industriousness in the form of capital and they want to deploy it hopefully into someone or a group, a team with the use case and the competency to develop it, right? Uh, they want to back that horse, if you will. They want to make that investment. That would be a good match. How would you go about that matching process? Yeah, most of the time happened that uh, they want me to be in the middle to uh, sort of an uh, uh, sort of offering a guarantee of uh, you know the the proceeding so many people they invest they they are they're not required to have a deep knowledge technical knowledge uh, or knowledge of business model related to the centralized system they think an opportunity is good before putting the money they call uh, consulting uh, there is an analysis of the project, an analysis of the people, how they're prepared, how much they want to go. And if they are valid uh, and they want to invest, uh, they keep asking a supervision uh, for a certain amount of time just to make sure that the project goes in the right direction. So I think which all, these, something... right, all these dev groups need a mentor. All these dev groups do because they don't have generally a business background and also they don't come from the VC space. If they did, they would not need to go seek external funding, obviously. And so this is something that you have done and that you've honed in on and that you know the dangers, which VCs to stay away from and which ones to go towards. You also know essentially how to how, how one of these small dev groups seeking external funding, um, what other alternative forms of funding there are, right? And then uh, as well as maybe how they can best come prepared. Can you tell me a little bit about alternative forms other than VC funding? Well, as I was mentioning before, to me, the best way is always uh, to self-propel, uh, to self-finance, uh, starting with a small product. Obviously, sometimes people need the micro angel start like 10,000, 20,000 just to be able to build the essentials. But uh, don't go much further than that. With that, uh, you create uh, an essential things. Uh, I always do the example of Google. White page, one search bar, one button, you know, and you have your service done. If you can reduce it to the minimal terms like that, uh, and you see the traction, because most of the time people comes out with an idea they think is genius. As soon as they come out, they realize that the public actually want uh, something else. The consumer of their application are not there for what they thought it was the plus but uh, for something else. There was a very funny story of this company that made a super complex ERP system. They had the function to import Excel and many companies were using just the button to import Excel and then move it to somewhere else because <laughs> it was the only thing essential. They would have made uh, 10 times more the money if they were, you know, like pivoting and just doing the button to import Excel because that was the strength. But they didn't realize it until, uh, you know, people start telling them, uh, you know, because that was the the only thing people were using on their application. So why is waiting on everything else if you found uh, your uh, space uh, in a certain things that you didn't know. So growing slowly allow you to address, to pivot uh, and uh, be there for what is important. That's also and, and doesn't need to have a lot of money up front, right? Right, right. I mean, so I mean, as long as you can sustain a minimal, safe and healthy lifestyle, you can get together. Heck, you can rent a house in a safe area and one of you can go off and, and, and bring in some income and three of you can be plugging away all day. Now, now the thing about the capital is the market, right? Because you can have, uh, you know, uh, the Garden of Eden off in uh, this is somewhere that's sort of desolate, you know, out there, but it's there, it's there, you know, everyone wants paradise. And then 
But, you know, if, if you don't have a microphone and you can't amplify it, then no one's going to know it's there. And now looking at the walled gardens that is Web 2.0 and the capital that's involved to, you know, propel these messages forward, you also have somewhat of experience in digital marketing, right? So you know how to get the word out. Can you maybe tell, give someone a tip or two? To be honest, uh, uh, you need to have a, a very good uh, landing place where people, when they arrive to you, they need to find something because they arrive to you, they find nothing as that's bad. But uh, they will arrive to you only if they hear about you from a third party. And uh, here, like it or not, influencers are key. Uh, somebody that has a YouTube channel with a consistent amount of views, uh, that is happy to promote your your idea your things you know like uh, and put a voice somebody that just retweet uh, something i always say to people i can do the most uh, things the nonsense like uh, dog poo in plastic if elon musk retweet the link to buy my dog poo in plastic i will sell millions of them in one day you know so these are the best shortcut uh, networking a lot uh, go out uh, have uh, you know the pleasure of meeting people sharing business card telling your story even if it's not a direct sale it leaves uh, like a background of a uh, rumor of noise uh, that when people hear you for the second time they go like, like a white noise right <laughs> Yeah, and uh, yeah. this helps out a lot, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, I mean, I, I find a lot of engineers that I've known, a lot of devs in the space, they're introverted, right? And that is that's that is something, I mean, it, it does make sense in terms of temperament and, you know. So, um, what I've seen, as, as I like the you know, story of Apple, where you had this aggressive, sort of, you know, pompous, but very, you know, proud of himself, but visionary, you know, guy, guy Jobs. And then you had the, the, the minds behind it, right? Uh, 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 Wozniak, right? Wozniak, am I saying that right? Wozniak. And, and then together they built just, I mean, I mean Apple, as we know it today, this, 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 this uh, magnificent devices and this art essentially in the form of technology that, that just led to mass adoption probably in ways that we hardly understand yet, but history will look back on. Uh, the, 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 the podcast, right? I mean, people are calling it a podcast. That's, that's from Apple. Uh, so it's a cast. Um, so what do you recommend for these guys? Right, these guys who are like three devs in a room, what should they do? Well, yeah, um, for sure, uh, a geek, like uh, how you wanna call it, uh, the tech guy, because it's it's introverts, not a introverts. <laughs> I am one of them, right? It is hard to uh, confront the rest of the world when you live safely in your small nest. And these, these people who have a time to sell, they need to have a very loyal and uh, trustworthy friend that has the face to go out and tell stories because uh, that's what makes the difference. And don't be jealous if the, the, the spotlight is on this other person on them because uh, who knows about Wozniak and uh, who knows about Steve Jobs, a different amount of people and uh, who was Apple, nobody, if I say who's the man that represents Apple, everybody will say Steve Jobs, nobody will say Steve Wozniak that, uh, you know, actually did the things behind, you know. But uh, uh, th there must be respect. We tend to think that because the technology is the product, 80% of the importance in the technology. Knowledge. The truth is, when there are money in a startup, uh, you put half in promoting and half in creating. Because uh, without promotion, you can have the best product yeah. of the, but nobody knows about it. So exactly. uh, people exactly. need not to be shy and not to be stingy. In, uh, and while a tech guy would think that uh, the money spent in promoting are thrown away, are no use. People automatically are gonna love their things because it's their baby. And that's not true, <laughs> right? It's uh, absolutely not true. Yeah, so people, people undervalue in tech, the, the salesmanship, the storytelling, the, the marketing. And that, you know, I find that to be so, it's so naive. And really at the end of the day, the messaging hurts the devs because now they're never gonna get found. I know, and it's, it's a strange, uh, uh, it's a strange aspect because on the other side up and the opposite uh, the guy that is very powerful to make sales uh, they think that anybody can make the tech that's the, really the useless part of the job because we without him so there is these two egos that are quite big that's why it's very difficult to find uh, uh, couples that works well so right you, tell me about uh, think, that who works well how do these two alphas like you said you want to focus alpha uh, alpha how does that work well think, think about this uh, artist uh, painter 
the painter, the real artist is abandoning his art, is unable to sell his own painting. Usually the wife is the cold uh, or vice versa, you know, agent to make sure that the sale is done. And they have a common interest because they have a family to support. So one keep doing the artist, the other keep doing the sales. And this is to be the relationship that there is uh, in a startup between those that go out and sell and those that implement the product. And they need to have a common goal. They, they need to keep their ego a little bit uh, deflated when they are with each other and understand that both need each other uh, tremendously because yes. without that, uh, uh, you know, the success is very limited. That is unfortunate. You know, there is one in a thousand that happened to be, you know, an article in an important magazine or he does something that, you know, trick the curiosity of somebody and randomly, you know, YouTube chose to promote these videos, you know, like, uh, and then they have a lot of uh, success, but those are luck. Yes. Luck is important. Yeah. You need to be lucky. That's one of the essential Position yourself uh, for luck. You can position yourself, but yes, yeah, yes. Cosmic, cir cosmic circumstances. circumstances. <laughs> yes, yes. Correct. Yeah, okay, I, okay. So, right. This is how we normally conceive of it, is that, that there is a, whenever there is a sacred, Right. I mean, in the non-theological sense, a sacred, you know, a, a high value schema. So we're doing this because we want to make everyone uh, have the ability of access to banking or to be able to generate yield or to be able to um, to receive money quickly across borders and not uh, lose 30 percent of it in the process. Right. Um, and so on and so forth. Like once you create this, we call it the sacred, but in, in a non-theological sense, just this, this really high, like a value hierarchy at the very top. And then you both say you meet the sales guy, right? And then the t devs, which are, I mean, the engineer, which are very temperamentally, generally different people. But you're right, they both have to be alpha effort that if they can congregate and then mutually sac sacrifice on that apex, then it will work. Then it will work because they will share in, the, in the, the ethos, the spirit of it. But uh, 90 percent of the time, even in very successful one, you end up with a divorce is, oh, yeah, is sure, incredible. Sure. Yeah. Friends raising hundreds of millions and, uh, you know, like thanks to the but, you know, is mostly also because when money comes in, people transform. Oh, yeah, it's the people worst. Been very nice and nice, but when there is no money, it's strange. As soon as there are money, everybody then start acting strange. So it is. Uh, that's exactly why I was saying at the beginning that the investor look at the people more than the product, because that's exactly what happened. People is what make or break a project. I really am sure that if there is the right combination of people, they can take anything simple and they can make it big because they know how to work together in that direction and being appreciated for that then you know is uh sometimes people tend to complicate their own life for no reason you know they oh, try I think to all the time something. people do this this is the habit that everyone has virtually everybody yes that's what it is <laughs> so 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 let's say you're, you're you're the vc right now and you're a benevolent vc and so you just want the best for these guys and you're you're doing so my background is behavioral you know uh uh, behavioral neuroscience, uh, you know, animal behavior comparisons, blah, blah, blah. So trying to understand people. Um, so now I'm profiling this guy or this group of guys. And, and I look at the two alphas, right? The tech and the sales guy, and I'm, uh, the entrepreneur. And I'm looking at them. What characteristics am I looking for? Assuming A, I'm going to give you two scenarios. One, they come from a background of abundance. Two, they come from a background of scarcity. So st let's start off with the abundance, let's say Northern America, and then scarcity the global south. What am I looking for? I, I do believe that uh, it doesn't make much difference uh, in terms of uh, when somebody has a brain. You know, if you're born with a capacity, you can uh, educate yourself online or go to a nice school. Uh, obviously, people that have to sweat it more are more respectful of things than people that had an easy life. We tend to be less respectful of things, right? But uh, yes. you cannot be absolutist in this, meaning that uh, there are good and bad people everywhere, right? Uh, so sometimes people that grow up in a more comfortable things are more uh, 
you know, secure of themselves, even if they don't have the basis to be secure of themselves. They were saying, you know, some university <laughs> title are just about selling, you know, confidence and not selling education for real because you went to that university, that means ah, you are the best. And, they say and, that on day one in think, Harvard. Day one in Harvard. You right, are the future right. leaders of the world. They haven't done it, a damn thing yet. <laughs> Crazy. Right. But 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 it's true. I mean, if you go out and, and you have the energy that you feel secure of yourself, you transmit it to other and other perceive it, uh, and they automatically behave consequently, right? Uh, if you think you're a failure because your parents told you so since you were a little kid, that you can be the genius, uh, but you will never transmit security and you know confidence uh, to 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 other people and they will not feel confident to give you their money so uh, there is uh, there are a lot of strange reasons why somebody is more successful but it, not only in business you know and everything in friendships in uh, relationships uh, uh, which is based on the personality because we it's react uh, for what we perceive uh, and you know we see are no less they can do all looking at the money but mostly you know, they invest in, they, the, the, the trick is that you go in statistic, you invest in 100, a little bit, three or four goes well, and they pay off for the others at the end of the day. So this is, uh, you know, like just you, cho you try to choose the good 100, but uh, at the end of the day is a statistical uh, game, you know, if sure. you're very good, uh, then you, you choose well, if, uh, if you're not good, you don't choose well. But uh, when, uh, when you confront somebody, you want to see somebody that feel, secure of what he's saying, you know, he, he knows what he's going to do, he feels he's going to succeed, uh, you know, because if he's full of doubts, then uh, <laughs> he's, right. he's not. Right, right. right. so this so, is the, yes, I'm oh, sorry, go ahead. You know, answering your question to me, I can speak with somebody that come from the big city, rich family, I can speak from somebody that, I mean, I live in Indonesia, so I have plenty of opportunities of speaking to somebody that uh, is a family of farmers. Uh, I, you can find the good and bad here and there, you know, obviously. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. So, so one, one of the, the hard and fast rules that we have, this is our belief, is that uh, the, the foundations believe and everyone producing work has and everything, essentially that all we have is our internal integrity that's ours that's the only thing that we own right outside of that even reputation especially nowadays with the internet everything being interconnected is essentially at the whims of the mob if you will right now you have to defend your reputation it's essential that you do that right but let's let's be honest you have your integrity and then you have a reputation that's subject to the whims so what you want to do strategically is if you're in tech usually you're marketing online is not to do that at the expense of your local community, a nearby metropolitan area, because then they get to see the consistency, the you, the who you are, the body movements, how you breathe. You, you communicate so much more in person, right? which is I always say, even online, I won't talk to anybody unless I get to see them, because why would I? What, what's, what's the purpose of that? I want to see and understand and exchange. So I, I, I think that's important for these guys to know it's that that don't limit yourself to the online space when it comes to networking and, and introducing yourself and your ideas oh. and your project. Please. No, 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 in person. I mean, when I said networking, I didn't even think online. To me, it was obviously yeah. shaking hands to somebody. Yeah, but people don't even, people honestly don't think that way, right? It, no, places like Singapore are fantastic for this thing. There is, there are really is, a, is a ritual. You go, you have, uh, you meet coffee. You, you, there are places where people, even if it's something totally unrelated with what you do, it's still a connection that somehow someday is gonna come back, or they know somebody and refer the word. Isn't because being a small place, uh, it takes a few days to feel it, you know. So small places are good, actually. This is a yeah, good, uh, is a good advice I never thought about first. Uh, small places, small communities are the best uh, because uh, you know you can you can fill it in in, in a very short time and uh, build a reputation. Uh, and uh, obviously, if you are genuine in uh, in in a short time, if you are in uh, immense space, that's why online doesn't work. <laughs> then uh, is despair that is like a drop in the ocean. So hardly is gonna is gonna work. I mean, it, it can, but it takes a lot of work and a lot of uh, time and a lot of luck. It takes a lot of capital so, and a lot of lying. 
I think, to generate a high reputation online as opposed to this approach strategically, if I was thinking Sung Su style, yeah. right? Say, you, you go out to your local community, they know you as a man, they know you as a person, they know your good deeds, they, they know you're imperfect and that you admit to it and that you're humble about it. And then when you go online, if you don't have this huge amount of capital to trick people into thinking you're benevolent and doing everything just for their interests and blah, 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 like this magical land of unicorns some people live in, right? Then they're like, no, 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 hey, wait, 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 no, 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 no. What you're saying, mob, is not proper, is not correct. You do not know this man. At yeah, the local communities, I think, from these small groups, that's the way to go. Is that fair, sir? One more interesting aspect that uh, comes to mind when you go to this, um, sometimes being in the wrong place helps. I don't know if it still exists, it's called Comdex, uh, where all the computer IT technologies are exposed. It was in Las Vegas, I was there. And I wanted to buy a graphic card. And there were those aisles full of uh, vendors. There must have been hundreds of graphic card choices to make. And I spent uh, one day walking and I couldn't make my decision. In another aisle, there was one guy selling mattresses. It was the only one selling mattresses in the old place. It went sold out in three seconds because there was no doubt of choice there, right? Yeah, yeah. So, like, uh, you know, you have an idea. You go to Silicon Valley. Probably there are places of success, but you are one in a million. You go in a place where you are the only one, uh, then uh, also the other people have no much other choice to make. Uh, they just come to you, right? Uh, so if uh, you have a nice Web3 project uh, that is about uh, wine, don't go in the tech world uh, because people will care less. Go in the wine expo and you are the only one with Boom. a Web3 project and uh, you win. That's right? it. So That's it. That's it. Go to the wider public because I think these developers and the, the crypto community, whatever that is, right? So. Yeah, these people itself. say again close on themselves they sometimes they ask me to go and speak why, why i have to speak my things to other blockchain people and telling them things they know what are we you know sitting there and looking at each other thing it doesn't really you know like it's not really the way you know you know to spread knowledge uh, invite me to talk about blockchain uh, in the I don't know, consortium of uh, the supply chain of coffee. And then I'm going to tell you something interesting because you don't know there it, you, you know, right? And the magazine for dentists, the how blockchain can help, uh, you know, X-ray to be transported from a dentist to another. I don't know. Something that uh, is uh, in the context of the audience, uh, but your subject is now in their context. And then you can bring it in and then you are the one doing it and then yes. people come to you, right? A hundred percent. So, I mean, now you're talking about strategy. So, so few people live their life by choice and then actually go through and dissect and say, what's the best strategic approach? They go through by chance looking for influencers to tell them how they did it. And usually how they did it has a large capital barrier to entry. It just does. So now they're going out to VCs, usually premature, and there could be great VCs. And I'm not poo-pooing on the VCs, but what I'm saying is that they don't understand the power of their own choice to act in their own communities, bringing in something unique, garnering their respect and reputation, and then spreading out, spreading out, and then maybe going online. Going online right. should not be step one. It just shouldn't be, and it most often is, no? It can also be in parallel, but don't expect too much from it, right? Or maybe there you get your places. reputation destroyed if you start too early. No. Agreed, agreed. Right, right, right. So, I mean, yeah, the importance of the local community. So, I just want to talk a little bit about NFTs because blockchain, I think, are the rails of the future, right? It's the internet of the future, at least in, in our immediate, you know, 20 years out. Who knows what the heck AI is going to produce, right? But, okay, so 20 years out. And you are, and so our audience is a mix of people who know about blockchain, digital assets, usually some speculators, other of them are more on the uh, ideological stance of, of digital asset. And, and But then we also have the uh, the... the uh, different blockchain purists, right? So, I mean, we should have uh, public and permissionless uh, everywhere, always. I mean, sort of this, sort of, you know. So, can you just break down blockchain, private, public, permission, permissionless, just briefly, so people understand the full scope, like within like, you know, two minutes, just briefly. Well, I, I would say there is exactly a blockchain and the technology around it are very complex. Yes. So people who support one and another with full knowledge of what they're supporting are very few. Most is like a religion, you know, they follow what they hear and they mimic or they repeat. Blockchain mm -hmm. is a technology. Technology has no soul, no spirit, it doesn't understand <laughs> it's a piece of software and that's what he has to do, how he's programmed. So he can be used in many ways and uh, there is no reason to say one is bad, one is good. You know, if he does his work that he has to do, it's okay. So, I mean, I'm open to any kind of deployment of the technology, right? Uh, 
uh, the one that is public and open uh, to everybody is uh, for public and open. But if uh, there is a consortium of hospitals that need to move some information, probably they want to put it inside the private network so it's not accessible to the public. For what's, good the benefit? Reason, right? what's the benefit, though? Because people don't understand this. So a corporate blockchain of a consortium of hospitals. Give me an, a few just because, okay, so I'm walking in the hospital. And I've been there 10 times. No, no, no simply, the, the paradigm is simple. I mean, everything can be done centralized or decentralized, right? When you do it centralized, you need to elect a party to manage the information for everybody else, okay? This has uh, implication of different kinds. Right. Costs, right. which is one, security, which is another, because there is no redundancy replication unless they do backup and then maintenance. Uh, and also the dependency on the, the the party that is managing your data, right? So there is no real, uh, I can move whatever I want because, uh, you know, if I have a problem on a Saturday night and everybody's at home, I can call them as much as I want. My problem is going to be solved on Monday, right? If I have managing my own oh, system. That never happens. What are you talking about? When does that ever right, happen? No. <laughs> so, so the choice to the on top of the participants so they run their own node uh, with allow them to have hybrid information some data is stored locally not to be distributed because the regulators want such uh, there are uh, very fast uh, search possibility because you have your data in place you don't need to do queries online and uh, there are a lot of uh, advantages but sometimes there are solutions that are better to be centralized than we don't have to you know there are every use case has its own uh, aspect. Decentralizing is something that is, uh, a, you know, a trend that, that is not a trend because it's good, it's because where we are evolving to, you know. There are uh, a lot of kids with it's a not thumb, with a thumb on the other side of the hand and people think it's an handicap, that's an actual evolution. We are evolving to have a shorter and shorter toes because we don't use them much and uh, one extra finger because we need uh, to manipulate and grab stuff more. So we are going to evolve in a certain way. Information technology is evolving toward decentralization, is uh, removing the middle parties uh, and is connecting the two ends directly. And that's what is happening. Uh, in terms of uh, permission, permissionless, uh, private or public, uh, it's really a matter of uh, need. So there is no good and bad also there. Uh, just to explain very, very simply. No, so inherently, not inherent in the technology is it good or bad. It could be applied good or bad, but inherent in the no, technology yeah. is just a technology. Uh, but also there is not an absolute uh, private blockchain are a bad thing or are wrong or no, there are needs where they need to be private for good reasons and people is free to deploy the private blockchain. So private means uh, there is inside a sort of uh, a VPN. So the connection are encrypted only if you have the keys to access the network is like a intranet was called in the past <laughs> something that is uh, like now in the internet but is a sort of a network between parties that can be open in the geographically it doesn't have to be one building is yeah, the open, intranet, but is... right that's web one was the intranet and that's sort of what we're seeing with the private blockchain kind of yeah, the term intranet was more like the network inside the company inside more company through vpn and using the, using the internet as transport layer, but uh, the network is private, so you cannot access, you cannot see the data because it's encrypted. And uh, this is a private blockchain. Public uh, means that uh, is in the internet, so anybody can uh, see and uh, and access it. Uh, then permission and uh, permissionless uh, is another thing. So permissionless. Uh, means that anybody can access. For example, Bitcoin is a public and permissionless. Nobody stopped me from creating a Bitcoin account and uh, then receiving Bitcoin and sending Bitcoin to other. And there is no party that technically can stop me from doing that because it's coded in such a way that everybody can join uh, or running a node or something else. Uh, if it was uh, uh, permissioned, probably there could be a special account there is an administrator account the flag my account as enabled to uh, send and receive if this administrator doesn't flag or flag me off then so there is a still a sort of a centralized decision making but in a network that is fully decentralized so it's transparent and you can see who did that what <laughs> but yeah also those are are a necessity i don't know like a strange use case could be 
politician uh, tells their promises before the election they're saved in uh, public record and uh, oh, but they are the that? only one that they can write a promise if you are now in a list to be elected you cannot post promises in the blockchain so uh. it will be permission to only allow them to write their promise but it's public because everybody can see that oh my god That's so, to give yes that would be amazing i can't i can't i can't just, I have to stay away from politics but i would that is amazing. Imagine that, right? Promises held on the blockchain and then periodically looked at. But let you know, we'll, we'll let others deal with that. Um, but yes, right, exactly. I got you. I am with you. Uh, anything else on, on on it in terms of permissionless and public? Public and permissionless is Bitcoin. Is the the classic yeah. blockchain where everybody can participate. There are systems for uh, also giving a little bit of power to has more coin. Uh, there is all the governance aspect uh, that, uh, you know, or, you know, like in Bitcoin, there is no governance, meaning that you cannot vote for anything. But there are blockchain where choices are made by people more with different rules. That's, that's exactly why it's beautiful. You know, there are infinite level of models that can be built and the good ones are going to prosper. The bad ones are going to die. So, you know, we are at the infancy moment of blockchain uh, and the centralization. So in five years, 10 years, we're going to see better what are the models that work and what not, you know. Yeah, and we're going to realize that some work for some Just things. For yeah, one thing I suggest, don't confuse the quality of the technology with the value of the coin. Because there is no relation whatsoever. Sometimes a coin is super valuable and the technology is very bad. Other time you have yeah. a technology fantastic, but the coin is worth nothing. So there are there is no correlation between the two things. Yeah, between I mean, other than you have these tokens with total locked in value where people just I mean, you know, they have a certain amount of money in there. So you look at the token. I mean, it's, just, it's speculation. It's in its infancy. You look at the top 10, maybe top 15, top 20, some of the later ones that you feel good about that, you know, I mean, that, that makes sense to me beyond that. Uh, I, I do think NFTs have a real use case. Um, and I know that you also believe that NFTs have a real use case, but people don't know what. OK, so some people know what NFTs are, but they're few and they don't tell the ones who don't. So please enlighten us, <laughs> the one who knows very much about NFTs, about NFTs. I will say people know what NFT are, but people don't know what NFT are because uh, uh, people know what NFT are is digital art uh, or is representation of art sold in the blockchain. But doesn't mean that they know technologically what they are. Uh, an NFT is just a piece of text uh, saved in the blockchain with some rules attached to it. OK, mm -hmm. uh, that's, that's the basic of it. In fact, uh, many companies use it uh, for the warranty system. So you buy a product, the warranty is as NFT. So it has an expiry date. Uh, when you send the product in warranty, they check in the blockchain if it's valid or not. So a very common use. Uh, uh, others, uh, they can use it uh, for the specification of a product. If you want to reorder it, uh, you know, there. So when you buy a product, they add it to your wallet, the NFT of the product. So you can reorder it with the same specification. It's custom made the product with the you know so there are a lot of interesting uses uh, of a unique piece of text uh, in the blockchain the unique and uh, yes. that's, that's the that's the that's the key right that's because sort of the key to an nft the right of the blockchain brought in the information technology is uh, to have uh, a digital asset that is singular is unique singular. Uh, the, the singularity of digital asset before I can make a copy of an MP3 file, you don't know which is the original because there are exact copies, right? Uh, in uh, in the in the blockchain, I cannot make a copy of my Bitcoin and give it to you because if I could do that, the Bitcoin oh. would be worth zero. Oh, right? no, 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 right, no, 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 but just between you and I, though, it's cool. Don't tell anyone, though. It would be good. <laughs> right. Sorry, and, uh, and in fact, this brings to a very important point, which is the double spending, right? Which is the key of security for blockchain mm -hmm. and uh, mm -hmm. how they are protected. Um, and there is a huge debate here because until you use blockchain for cryptocurrency, some choices are all good. When you start using it for medical record, for example, you don't care about cryptocurrency in the blockchain. So you need to have a decentralized platform that remains safe and secure, even if uh, there is no value, right? Because most blockchain are secure, not because the secure system is safe, but because it's too expensive to attack them. Oh, it doesn't yes. make there is interesting performing the attack. But uh, 
if uh, you remove the aspect of the value, then they become weak. It's a legend that blockchain are secure and safe. You know, there are constant attacks uh, where people spend uh, twice and it happen, uh, it happen and it happen. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, it's still in its infancy. And I mean, we talked earlier about this uh, market inflation that happened. So essentially what's happening in traditional finance in days bygone uh, or, or currently, who knows, right? Uh, probably uh, is happening in DeFi, and again, it's in its nascency. So people are learning, uh, for example, how to navigate DeFi, how to store their digital assets, right? I mean, just with the, what happened with Celsius, Voyager, Vault, and now in Chapter Eleven, all this uncertainty. I mean, it's a hard lesson on the crypto community, if you will. And like, I think it's people like yourself, like others. To be able to just explain to people that things are in its nascency, that really it is. I mean, it's that doesn't doesn't mean don't be bullish on it because I'm bullish as all heck on you know, Ethereum and Matic and Bitcoin, for example, right? I I, I I just think that it's some of the future that they're going to build this beautiful you know uh, opt-in opt-out system in the in on the Ethereum network using probably Matic Rails and that Bitcoin I just find to be the truest form of money me personally, um, but uh, that these people who are looking at all these people, all these Bitcoin billionaires going to the moon, that they need to be careful. And so what do, you, what do you have to say about relative to, because you're so well, you have so much knowledge in blockchain, where it's in its nascency, DeFi is in its nascency. We discussed earlier that you're not an expert in finance, but you know what's happening in DeFi and you put yourself, you're a humble man. Um, what, should, what would you advise people who are just getting into the, digital asset space who are buying things, let's say on uh, Uniswap or something. Right, first of all, a disclaimer, I'm not a financial advisor, so I don't give financial advice. Whatever I say doesn't have whatever value, it's just my point of view. Roberto and I both, yes. <laughs> Correct, but so now it's important to say that people don't say, ah. And uh, second, the, let me say the good things about DeFi, okay? Please. Uh, you, usually people were when Lambo, when Lambo and saying when I'm going to purchase a Lamborghini with the money that I do with crypto. And I saw a tweet from somebody that says, this is not the Lambo story, but I managed to borrow enough money to purchase uh, uh, the family car and return it, leaving as uh, collateral my Bitcoin without losing them. I return my things, I pay my installment, and I did everything in five minutes without signing any form, exactly. without anybody asking what's my name, and I did everything smoothly. And I thought, look, in the moment that somebody like my mom or my auntie can uh, access this kind of service without having to become an expert in a crypto wallet, digital signature, etc., etc. Right. That's really the risk. Uh, the financial institution were scared about the cryptocurrency. Nah, the cryptocurrency is nothing. DeFi has had the chance to become uh, the real, uh, you know, things that will make a financial institution scary. Every time my bank uh, make it hard for me to do a simple operation because uh, we so need to submit the document here give and there. Give an example. Give an example about that. that. So what, what do you mean? So what do you mean the financial institutions make it hard? No, and how can blockchain make it better? I have a company around the world, you know, and uh, I call a bank. So financial institutions are forced by regulator to follow certain procedures. Sometimes they require documentation to be sent. Happened that my office didn't send it. I'd need to do move money from the bank in Hong Kong. I call them and they give me our time. And now you need to submit the account is blocked because, uh, and I tell them, you are promoting cryptocurrency. <laughs> when you do this to me, you are promoting cryptocurrency because there nobody makes my life hard. I do my process and I do it as simple as it is. And uh, unfortunately, financial institutions are not there to upset their client, but they need to follow the law, set up the regulators uh, that in 2022, they still think the people has a fax machine at home in the office <laughs> and they want it's people amazing, to right? send document via fax to them. It is insane. So you can go to a very evolved country like Singapore and uh, you are forced to deal with the bank through faxes and uh, I don't That's have incredible. a fax and uh, how and that also the regulator says that the form has to be hand filled because you know they need to make sure that the person is the right person and that there are mistakes I open a bank account in Singapore and the lady had a PDF file in her computer. She could have easily filled it out with the keyboard but she printed it she filled it by hand 
And uh, as my name is Roberto Capodieci, my email is roberto at capodieci.com. The Capodieci, the letter A, when the data entry people enter it, they enter like number two. So the email address registered with the bank account was uh. roberto at c number two podieci.com. So I couldn't receive the email uh, to oh, activate my bank okay. account. Fantastic, fantastic, fantastic. So I called the bank and I said, hey, you need to fix my email address. And they say, oh, well, you need to download this form, seven pages of form, Come fill on. it in by hand and well, fax it back to yeah. us. Yeah, just to fix the, you know, so yeah. at this point, I just registered the domain name uh, c2podh.com <laughs> and I received the email and I created the account, uh, solving the problem. But uh, in reality, all these issues, all these problems are generated by a flow and a mechanics that with the decentralized, be automatically removed. Uh, the identity they're managing blockchain with the cryptographic signature have a value and it's getting be adopted by uh, many countries. I am an e-resident of Estonia. I have my Estonian ID card that contains a certificate with a private key. From anywhere in the world, I can open a bank account and I sign using my ID card, Love as it. simple as it is. We made uh, one blockchain uh, that to post transaction, you don't sign it with your uh, wallet, but you sign with the Estonian ID card. <laughs> I can give you the link to watch the video. It's very interesting. In this way, yeah, the let's transaction... Post the let's post the link in the description so people can Absolutely. see it. Absolutely. Yeah. In this way, the transaction is valid uh, in the court of law. Say I make a, block, a blockchain to do rental contract, the Airbnb in a decentralized manner. When you rent the apartment, you sign with your government ID card, and that's a signed rental contract that is valid. In a decentralized manner, directly between owner and person, with uh, you know no middleman like Airbnb. So the evolution, and this will be a contract that is an NFT, if you want to call it like this, but it's just a text with a signature on the blockchain, right? So yeah, definitely, we need to discuss NFTs and go deeper, and we will, and we'll bring you back on to do that, because people really need to understand what the value of NFTs are and this self-executing smart contract thing and, and, and how that intersects with the blockchain in the future. So um, anyway, you, uh, you were saying uh, before. Uh in, in thinking about the centralizing mechanics, so we are so focused uh, to think that the blockchain is decentralized, right? You think there are blockchain that are hosted 40% on a single cloud uh, provider. So all the nodes are in the hand of a single company and this kills the decentralization. But even if everybody had a home, their own node, in a country there are now three or four internet service provider. Large country can have five, but no more than that. And this entry point to the internet, uh, they are also a centralization point because they can censor you, they can sniff packet that goes through, they can inject uh, information. So the real decentralization we're going to achieve is when we have a mesh network. So each house, uh, when you have the modem, uh, is actually one node. Uh, of a peer-to-peer -peer network that makes the internet uh, and you can connect uh, through any point of access. Then this is very similar to the technology that there is uh, in the G5. Uh, the people think kills bird. Uh, actually, it creates a problem for government because it's much harder to trace and record the phone calls because uh, the routing so, of the G5 so. allow me to go only through this last cell to call somebody that is next to me without going inside the phone company. So oh, that's yeah. why there was uh, a lot of uh, pressure against it, right? It is uh, it is uh, better for the user, for the consumer uh, as technology. Can you explain that to... a little bit? Just get into this mesh network. Is, I mean, again, we, we know it. People, Absolutely. Yeah, let's just say, you know, a few yes. solid use cases for like people who they have their modem and now they're looking for a hotspot and maybe they're afraid about privacy or whatever, something like that. Right, but for example, in developing countries, uh, I think the biggest mesh network we have now is Starlink, uh, provided yeah. to us by Elon Musk. The beauty of Starlink is that you connect directly to the satellite, uh, then the satellite make a network with each other, and you go down uh, to somebody directly, so you don't touch any ground connection. So nobody has a means to intercept your connectivity. So this is a mesh network made by micro satellites that are very small, they're like... Uh, no, no, no bigger than this, uh, and there are hundreds <laughs> in the sky. And this is a genius thing that Elon Musk did. Uh, many people don't appreciate uh, the technology behind it. But if we had a similar thing into 
uh, some small boxes in our houses that had a very strong Wi-Fi signal and they connect one to the other, then somebody can publish a website in this network, only take one person with an internet connection and all this network is already connected to the rest of the internet. Right. Uh, they are used by the army when they go to do exercise in the yep. jungle, they bring yep. cell phone towers and things connected in this way, but they are, they are used and developed also in developing countries where there is no reach of the internet uh, in particular areas. Uh, so mesh network are good. But can, can you imagine developing it in a city? So you walk and yeah. uh, you are connected yeah. without connecting to one internet service provider specifically, which would be amazing. Yeah. Okay, say, say that again, because we just had a, a sound in here. So say that, that, yeah, connecting in the city, right? I mean, so what would that mean for a city if there's like just one internet provider and like they can just shut you down? No, right? even, you, you, don't, you don't even need it. Uh, you connect to this network of many modems that makes the internet, uh, right? So if it was Mesh. capillarily yeah. distributed, uh, bridging through... Uh, the satellites, you can connect all the world without going to a single internet service provider. Oh my goodness. And that's the oh. decentralizing oh. network, then you build a blockchain decentralized on top of it uh, to decentralize identity, to decentralize uh, management of a property. And that that will be that will be the future, uh, you know, where people own and control their own things. I love it. So much more cost efficient, so much quicker. Right, so much more. Uh, so this, I love this idea of self-executing, right? Which is a fundamental, almost evolutionary hit to our game theory, the way we transact with each other and how that's gonna play out. Once this is mass adopted, oh my goodness, who knows? Uh, just, you know, a world that we can't even imagine, I think. So, okay, our, our, uh, we're, I, we have to bring you back on NFTs because that's like, I really want to like dig into your brain on NFTs. And because people need to understand really what is around the corner and just to be prepared, if anything, um, but also it, 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 not knowledge is power, and I think people could use a little boost. Um, so just all right. So we li like to end with something a little silly, just rapid fire. Uh, hits a little bit on culture, kind of plays to the, the Bitcoin maxis a little bit. I'm kind of a Bitcoin maxi, but not really. And uh, you know, sort of fifty percent in, fifty percent out. And uh, you know, so let's have a little fun. So are you ready for rapid fire? All right. Uh, yes. All right. I love the excitement. All right. So number one, is Bitcoin the truest form of money? Yes or no? Or sentences? Two or three? Uh, so, or me, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> yes, no, um, but it's better than fiat uh, for sure. Okay. I'll take it. That I'll take. Excellent. Uh, what is your general sentiment regarding, like, so again, available capital for young uh, innovators that are looking to get out there, but don't want to get screwed in the process. In two to three sentences, what are these capable developers who've linked up with the sales guy? What is their first step? We sort of touched on it, but just kind of synthesize it for us. Present to the local community, as you were saying, I think is the best uh, first step before going big, uh, look in the surrounding, present to mom and dad, and then present to the larger, larger circle and then moved on uh, with the feedback you receive. Find people that can give honest feedback. That's the most important thing. Everybody is capable to say, oh, beautiful, amazing. But uh, very few can say, look, I think it's not going to work. <laughs> or, yeah, and ask them to be punishing about the feedback, right? I say, be punishing, please be punishing about your feedback so I can grow and get stronger. To take a, a small consulting with a psychologist is quite heavy. I've been through that. The people assault you. They make pieces of you. They make pieces of your project. They criticize everything. You want to cry. You feel in a corner. But they're actually giving you an amazing service. Don't take it personally. Most of people say things just uh, without deeping knowledge. But you understand why they didn't understood it, what was wrong, uh, you know, and what you can fix, uh, how you can communicate better your uh, your your idea so that's that's an important set of uh, you know processes to go through the yeah, good good faith criticism on a small group or one-on-one -on -one basis is absolutely fantastic when it's grounded in, 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 in good being good faith uh, but again if you go too quickly online you run the foul of the risk of reputational destruction on the whims of the passions of, of individuals who don't have expectations so 
not to be deluded, don't build expectation that cannot be satisfied, right? So never have an expectation, always put yourself and everything that comes is, is a plus. More you are into the spotlight, more people is gonna come and criticize, invent a lie and try to take you down because they're jealous. Uh, don't care about that, <laughs> go straight forward because I met so many in my life and is is sad. Uh, I, I I feel sad for them. No no more. You know what can you do? You know like uh, they're I overrun am the by modic. their passions. Yeah, they're overrun by their passions. Yeah, some people is jealous. Uh, some people uh, you know they want to see you go bad uh, or they want to go bad so they go better. Uh, other people just use you to get other things. So, uh, there are, there are more you evolve and more you go up. I don't want to even think what Elon Musk is subject to. You know or people oh to the caliber. Uh, uh, it must be so you need to build up the capacity to you know stay on top of that uh, yeah. you gotta let it bounce off of you you gotta be a stoic right you do things based on principle what you believe in not on the the madness of mobs uh okay so i know you're not too big into digital assets uh, or i mean you you sort of your knowledge is there but we don't talk about it much could you potentially give us an in if you were to be a, a speculator on what your f top five digital assets would be uh, talking about like tokens and coins and stuff like that, not about NFTs but specifically, but maybe tokens and coins that fuel NFT projects. Right. I, I do believe, uh, for example, the Bitcoin uh, is uh, representative of a brand and of, of a technology. So it's going to be the there forever. Popularize the blockchain, right? right? It's what brought everything up. So it, it is going to survive, doesn't matter what. And Ethereum uh, is actually there because uh, it has a very, very direct utility, meaning that you need to use the Ethereum to play with the uh, DeFi, to play with smart contract, the gas fees are all in Ethereum. So uh, I would say that those two, for as much as conservatives, my answer can be, uh, will be my my choice. I will never buy a, a bull monkey because uh, <laughs> I think that it's just uh, mentally insane uh, people that did that uh, i want to sit with them and understand why there is a reason why people buy nft to big amount of money is to loan their money you know say i have a uh, any type million of dollars that's the case any type of art that's the case it's yeah. always happened with art as well absolutely right. correct you save a million dollar and i make a small dot and i call it an nft and then i purchase it with a million dollar so the million dollar come from anonymous now i have a million dollar that is clean plus i can resell an nft that has been paid one million dollars so even if i sell it for half million the person is making a deal and i make more money so it's very convenient in those terms now i'm not saying the old nft sales go under this thing but uh, uh, there is for sure uh, a good set of uh, people that took the opportunity to to clean up uh, some uh, some funds. On the other on the other hand, uh, uh, for example, um, a jewel uh, sales company. I don't know if it was Tiffany or somebody like that. Uh, uh, start making some jewel that can be purchased only by people that own a Bar Monkey uh, Yacht Club. So they automatically target the public that has money. Right. They make an exclusive uh, item. So uh, the beauty of an NFT is that it's now closed in a single system. It's alive in the blockchain, so you can use it to get people to log into a website. Uh, and I can automatically check if the person own an NFT issued by the smart contract, uh, then can access uh, this website with some information. If you don't, uh, you don't access. So, so that's the beauty yeah, of so. Web3, right? The Web3, I can throw a part in the metaverse where only owner of a certain NFT can enter. And if you don't have an NFT from the smart contract, you don't enter. Right. So there is a lot of dynamics that can take place. Uh, and, uh, you know, think all the thing about the metaverse, which doesn't exist yet. The metaverse, uh, is uh, is to virtual world the, what the World Wide Web was to website. I want to so I, I, I want to keep that to our second conversation because I'm going to explore the heck out of your mind when it comes to the metaverse because everyone wants <laughs> to hear about it and I know you would know very much how NFTs will come into play with, with identity and the collectibles and then these. Okay, so but I we mean have, that yeah. of things. That's gold. We're going to sandbag the gold. Okay. But specifically for just like, okay, but what I heard recently, which was kind of cool, just as a aside, was that like, right, so the NFT is not legal tender. So you can take something that's trademarked, you can NFT it, you can sell it. Okay, now you've sold it. Do you really own the rights? Not really, right? Someone trademarked it. Uh, so, but we're not seeing too much, you know, Coca-Cola suing 
an NFT of Coca Cola at this moment, right? But then also someone can go on another chain and just do Coca Cola again and sell it. It could be one of one thousand. That's not an NFT, but they're called NFTs. So it's just like it's like there's this incredible use case of NFTs, and then there's the other stuff. And people, you know, we want to separate the signal from the noise. That's one of the the goals of this work, and that's why we have to bring it back because we want to explore NFTs specifically and how that's going to intersect with the metaverse and the yin and the yang of the metaverse uh, with you. Absolutely. Okay, got it. All right. So, okay, so this is a, kind of a fun one. Biggest existential risk facing, uh, so this emergent tech, blockchain, DeFi, digital assets, NFTs, DAOs, right? So just innovation, right? This, in this, this, what, is the, what do we have to be weary of? Well, I do, I do believe that uh, uh, we need to go back to the basis. Uh, blockchain, uh, the centralized platform are software, right? Uh, so... Uh, for as much as you want, you cannot stop it. And uh, the, the analogy that I would like to make is this. When uh, um, there were those uh, websites that were distributing movies and music, uh, Kaza and others, uh, government ended up uh, going there and shutting them down because we're clearly, you know, they can be localized and they were putting in trouble the person uh, managing those websites. When uh, BitTorrent came out, uh, it's a peer-to-peer -peer network. Uh, and uh, you cannot control it. There is no way to go and stop it. Uh, you kill one server, three more comes out in another place. So the regulator had to change approach. I mean, the big industry lobbied the government so much and the regulator started regulating the use of it. So if you are citizen of this country, you cannot use this and this and this. There are strange things. If you look, uh, for example, at the token uh, Tether, uh, the one that USDT, if you look in their website, it says, if you're a citizen of this, this, this country, you cannot use it. Would people care? How can you know that? The VPNs are everywhere. You know, you access it through another mechanics like the centralized system. There are no way to stop people from accessing it. And uh, the best thing is uh, working on culture. So understanding and surfing the wave together with others. I, I, I have this, this short story, exactly what I was mentioning before. When the movie and music industry saw BitTorrent come out, mm. they got scared and they started lobbying government to arrest a few kids and give them 100 years of prison or millions under millions of fine without realizing that they had a free distribution system to sell their content in every corner of the planet without even having to maintain the network. Just give people an alternative to pay and make me feel guilty if I take without paying. People would have paid and the few that take without paying, oh my God, they would have a copy of the CD anyway. So you will have used a distribution system and you will look good. Lobbying government to punish a few kids, they, they look horrible to everybody and they didn't stop anything because the system still exists all today. When uh, the same mechanics of peer-to-peer -peer, uh, build the blockchain and Bitcoin comes out, uh, many countries reacted in the same way. Forbidden, absolutely forbidden uh, people in prison. Other countries, they start thinking, okay, let, let's look at this technology. Many financial institutions are investing money because they understood that uh, owning means controlling it right. so once uh, they make their own uh, mechanics then you can have a protocol that is legal a protocol that is illegal you still can use it but the people is put in front of a choice and people tend to choose legal to illegal right mm. so you that's the, the the intelligent approach from a government uh, and they are working to make the the, the you know central bank uh, digital currencies uh, they are working in making blockchain network and this is uh, I think uh, on their side, the best approach on people's side is going to create an underground, the Tor network of, <laughs> of things. Uh, and yeah. uh, and the foreground, uh, there is more, uh, you know, like uh, uh, regulated and authorized one. Uh, this is what I see happening in the next future, though. A hundred percent, a hundred percent. And I think that, I mean, we live in this continue. It's funny, we think that we're separate from history and we're not. We're just a continuation of it if we want to recognize it or not. Perhaps we can see ourselves as the result of defining historical economic, usually driven by economic events. Um, and so we're in, again, this push-pull between uh, the people and the governed and us wanting human flourishing, uh, you know, for those of us who were born in, you know, democracies and kind of accept that as, as, as the standard as, and, you know, have that mindset, you know, they want to flourish, they want to innovate and, and so on and so forth. Um, so this constant push-pull I find is interesting and 
even damage done during this push pull uh, unilaterally downward is cause or an impetus of innovation and pushback not the revolution but what i'm saying is innovation right so solutions uh, again to alleviate suffering or solutions to to be able to get your 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 five dollars that took you let's say three hours to earn let's say and get it over the border to your family who needs to eat in, in another country without 70 percent or 50 percent or whatever the crazy amount they used to take right i mean so so people are finding a way and you know, as a drastic park it's like you know, life will find the way. It's like, yes, innovation, like, we'll find our way forward somehow. And, 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 and there's something about scarcity or uh, downward pressure, stifling, that has a way, I think, of naturally innovating. It, de- it depends on really how, how, how hard you squish the population, but a little squishing. Right. My, my opinion is that there is uh, always a gray area moment. So regulator, uh, stay here. Okay, technology stay here. If you serve this point, it's always gray. It's yet unregulated because regulator will never catch up with technology. When they catch up with this technology, technology is already further there. And see, there is always a way to do it in a part that is unregulated. And just for example, when I was a kid, there was no law on intellectual property in Italy. You can photocopy a book. Uh, outside the university, there were huge photocopy center. People were buying one book for 100 people. They were making photocopy wow. because there was no law protecting intellectual property. Yeah. So it wasn't illegal. Okay. And, and even less was illegal to make copy of video games because there was no regulation wow. about that. Oh, yeah, yeah, right. I was the from Germany, from the United States with the modem saving in floppy disk and reselling for a. <laughs> A very big surcharge and uh, making yeah. a small fortune. Then uh, the regulator catch up and they make a law for making legal immediately when the law was just proposed, not yet activated, we stopped doing it. So we always been fine. Those that didn't stop, uh, they got punished. Now here as well, uh, with all this cryptocurrency, DeFi, etc., etc., there is going to be an evolution because you need to evolve. You cannot stay where it is now, right? And the evolution is always going to be in this gray area that is unregulated and uh, <laughs> is while, while the regulator catch up with the technology that is already obsolete, right? You know, regulator today ask you to send a fax. Fax doesn't exist anymore, but uh, by the time they start saying email is good enough, probably we already stop using email, you know, and uh, and uh, we move at this, uh, in this way, I think. I, I think they ask for the fax just to give us a chuckle and they don't actually think. I wonder how many faxes are actually sent versus. You can mail. see I, them in an office going. Exactly. It's hilarious. Exactly. It's funny. I had two ways to respond to an agency, and I had to do it by fax or by call. By call, there was no way because you're routed to every route, and then you're. So I'm just like, mm, should I drive there or should I drop the case? Like I'm gonna drive there. So all right, all right. Let's finish up on this last piece. So. Um, What's one thing out of everything we discussed uh, that we've left out that you think that the people who, again, general audience doesn't know about blockchain, digital asset, NFT use case that uh, they should know going into the next three to five years about what's coming out of this emerging tech space? But like many beautiful technologies, uh, they act behind the scenes. People use an app in their phone and they don't know if uh, their data goes through a blockchain uh, or not, right? Uh, so the real evolution and the real success arise when people have no idea that they're using it, right? Uh, that's to me uh, the best uh, the best aspect because it means it's being fully accepted, uh, embedded uh, and is part of everyday life. I do believe that uh, uh, culture is uh, culture sometimes catch up slower than regulators if you want so the general public understanding the benefit and demanding solution to be brought into the centralized platform is going to be what is going to push the evolution more so yes uh, my suggestion to the general public is understand what it means understand what the peer-to-peer network is uh, and how it works uh, what the cryptographic signature is and why it's important compared to the normal one how processes documentation flow bureaucracy can be smoothened and brought to a better uh, 
you know, access and, and use of friction by decentralized systems. Yeah. That frictionless, self-executing, I mean, human flourishing that's borderless and that is just driving us forward and we can't really tell where, but at least we can say in a smoother direction, assuming that we remain good stewards of the planet in the process. I think that would be a good way to, to, to think of it, right? And that, you know, that, that, that we have a gentle dance between the regulators and the innovators in good faith. In good faith. And I think that's the spirit. One thing you said, if I may add this one, Please. sorry if we were trying to... No, no, go ahead. You said the very beautiful word, which is borderless. Yes. And when you ask if uh, is Bitcoin the perfect currency, my answer will be Bitcoin open our eyes uh, in uh, getting out of the box of thinking that uh, a currency ends where the border of the country ends. Like who said that the currency should be limited by the geographical border of a country? You know, big corporation tell us that, uh, you know, Starbucks credits are working everywhere rather than you know is the same thing so mm -hmm. why not the currency why cannot we have a currency that is not owned by one country and exactly. work in the country but yeah, multiple uh, you know, competing right Com -com competing I, I reserves fantastic because one bitcoin is one bitcoin everywhere then can exactly. have a different project power but that depends on the economy of the country but one bitcoin is one bitcoin period you know like it is uh, that's the great thing right that, that, that's what i love about it really that is what i love about it and that we can't mingle i mean i'm sure people can play with the markets but the more the liquidity the harder it is to play with the markets and it's always again it's it, it's it's an asset and people don't understand ownership versus cash they don't understand that people make money by buying right good property and what's good property it's scarce and it's desirable and it's easily transferable and it's less easy to be confiscated, let's say if you are in a, in a country with more civil unrest or whatever it is, a less scrupulous government or something. It's like, so it's, that's to me why it makes it the apex asset, you know, in a way, but, um, but, but the virtue of it popularizing blockchain, that's what makes it so special. I, I, I mean, I do think it's a pure, I mean, I am in that camp, but I think it's done so much more than just introduce the, and I'm not saying it's going to be a competing reserve currency, but I do like the idea of competition. And the more competition we have, the more responsible we will be because of the backlash that comes from acting irresponsible if you have a hold on a market or a market sector or whatever it is. Well, tell me, what was your favorite part of this cast? Well, I, I had a moment of revelation when uh, I analyzed uh, in the suggesting young entrepreneurs, startups, uh, how to approach things. Uh, this the the access to the small communities in fact uh, one thing that makes a thought sense and i never actually you know like uh, realized it uh, objectively in my mind so i really thank you for the added knowledge uh, and uh, you know awareness uh, that this chat has given me you know that was naturally emergent that's mirror neurons that's the beauty of having like a meaningful conversation and so now we both know it and so we both benefited you know that, that's a great thing <laughs> So anyway, uh, Roberto, I mean, thank you for that. And thank you so much for your time. I know it's really late by you and we've, we've gone long and, and you're still energetic, so sleep well tonight. But I'm gonna have to ask you, you have to come on next time uh, in a couple, a couple months, because we really want to explore NFTs and metaverse and, and how, that, how that's really gonna play out and the yin and the yang that we discussed earlier. Absolutely, it's gonna be a pleasure. Roberto, you've been a true gentleman and thank you so much. Thanks very much. <laughs> Bye. Take care now. Cheers.